And speaking of Lexington, Billy Dawes arrived at Clark's house while they were waiting, while they were checking on the British. Don't blame him for getting there half an hour late after Revere, his route was longer. While Dawes and Revere had a quick snack, you have to eat even in the middle of a famous historical event. Captain John Parker got the Lexington Minutemen together on the town common. They had their guns. They were ready to defend their town. The only problem was there was nothing to do. The British were nowhere in sight. It was a cold night. Parker couldn't keep his men standing out there forever. So he let the men go, but told them to listen for William Diamond beating his drum. This was the signal for the Minutemen to come running back to Lexington Common. Some of the men went home, others walked across the common to Buckman's Tavern, where they waited with a drink by the warm fire. At about 1 a.m., Revere and Dawes left Clark's house. Riding on the very tired horses, they started down the road towards Concord. They still had to warn the people there that, well, you know what. On their way out of Lexington, they met up with Samuel Prescott, a young doctor from Concord. Prescott was heading home from his fiancée Lydia's house. He offered to help spread the alarm with Revere and Dawes. The three of them set off together. Now, remember those armed British soldiers that General Gage sent out to patrol the roads? They're about to make a sudden appearance. Captured On the way to Concord, Prescott, on the way to Concord, Prescott and Dawes stopped to warn people in the house beside the road. Revere rode up ahead a bit just to check out the path he spotted two British officers hiding in the shadows of a tree. They spotted him too. Then a lot of things happened very quickly. Revere shouted a warning to Prescott and Dawes. A few more British soldiers charged out from the shadows, pointing their pistols and shouting, If you go an inch farther, you are a dead man. Thus, uh, this didn't stop anyone. Revere, Prescott, and Dawes all dashed off in different directions. Prescott jumped his horse over a stone wall and raced down the road. Dawes tried to trick the British by pretending to be one of them. Hello, boys. I've got two of them, he yelled, galloping his horse toward the woods. But then, for some reason, he fell off. He scrambled to his feet and darted into the dark woods on foot. Dawes watched, flew off of his pocket where he fell from his horse. A few days later, when the coast was clear, he came back and found it. Revere also raced his horse towards the woods, but he rode right to the spot where six more British officers were hiding. They stepped out of the shadows, held their guns on Revere, and started questioning him. Sir, may I have your name? My name is Revere. What? Paul Revere? Yes. The guys knew who Paul Revere was, and they had a good idea of what he was, had been doing. Revere never forgot what happened next. One of them clapped his pistol to my head, called me by name, and told me he was going to ask me some questions. And if I did not give him true answers... He would blow my brains out. Revere admitted that he had been out warning people that the British army was on its way. The British cursed at him and kept threatening to shoot him. But they had to patrol the road, and they didn't want to worry about keeping an eye on him. So they took his horse and let him go. Revere stumbled through pastures and a graveyard on his way back to Lexington. Meanwhile, Dawes was somewhere in the woods without a horse. If anyone was going to get to Concord in time to warn the town, it would have to be Prescott. Good thing he stayed so late at Lydia's. They haven't left yet? Revere made it back to the Reverend Clark's house in Lexington at about 3.30 in the morning. And guess what? Adams and Hancock were still there. With the British soldiers marching closer and closer, Hancock was stopped insisting that he was going to stay and fight. Dorothy Quincy recalled, Mr. Hancock was all night cleaning his gun and sword and was determined to go out to the plain by the meeting house where the battle was, to fight with the men who had collected. Finally, somehow, Adams convinced Hancock that they'd better get going. Carriage was prepared for their escape. Before Hancock climbed in, he had time for one last argument, this time with his fiancée. Dorothy mentioned that she was going back to her father's house in Boston. Hancock objected. Mr. Hancock said, no, ma'am, you shall not return as long as there is a British bayonet left in Boston, Miss Quincy said. Recollect, Mr. Hancock, I am not under your authority yet. I shall go to my father's house tomorrow. Poor Adams must have been rolling his eyes in the back of the carriage. At least the argument was short. In a minute, Adams and Hancock made their escape. Dorothy wasn't sorry to see John Adams' carriage drive away. 
At that time, I should have been very glad to have got rid of him, she said. She and Aunt Lydia stayed behind at the Clark's house. Later that morning, from the, th from the second story window, they watched the American Revolution begin. Beat that drum, Billy. Now it was a few minutes after 4 a.m., you know, that cold gray light that comes just before sunrise. That's how it was in Lexington and when the British Army was finally spotted on the road outside town. They were a mile away and coming on fast. Captain Porker told 16-year-old William Diamond to start beating his drum. Lexington Minute men grabbed their guns and ran into town. Who fired the shot heard around the world? As the wagon rattled out of Lexington on the morning of April 19th, Samuel Adams and John Hancock could only guess at what was going on back in town. They heard William Diamond's drum beating, and they knew what, the, what that meant. A few minutes later, they heard a gunshot, then a huge burst of gunfire. Glorious morning. When Samuel Adams heard the explosion of gunfi gunfire from Lexington, he had a pretty good idea of what had just happened. Oh, what a glorious morning is this he said. John Hancock thought Adams was talking about the weather, which was not bad, but not glorious. Adams clarified, I mean, what a glorious morning for America. What was so glorious about it? Adams must have been thinking that those early morning shots would be the start of a long, hard fight for American independence. Hancock must have been thinking about lunch. He sent a messenger back to Lexington, instructing Dorothy and Aunt Lydia to meet him in Woburn, where Adams and Hancock were now headed. He told them to bring the fine salmon that they had planned to eat that day. Wait a minute, the American Revolution just started, and we're talking about salmon? What just happened back there on Lexington and Common? Gathering evidence. We're not exactly sure. British and American witnesses tell different versions of the story. You have to listen to some of the evidence and come to your own conclusions. Just after sunrise on April 19, 1775, Major John Pitcorn, Pitcairn, Major John Pitcairn led the first group of British troops into Lexington. This guy was itching for a fight, as he had recently written, I am satisfied that one active campaign, a smart action, and burning two or three of their towns will set everything to rights. Nothing now, I'm afraid, but this will ever convince those foolish bad people that England is in earnest. Nice guy, huh? But Pitcairn wasn't supposed to stop in Lexington on April 19th. Him and his men were out in front of the other British soldiers because they were rushing on to Concord. Their mission, get to Concord as quickly as possible and take control of the bridges in town. Remember, the British were already hours behind schedule, so Pitcairn was hoping to march right through Lexington. When he saw the Lexington Minutemen lined up on the town common, they were about 70 of them, ranging in age from 16 to 65. They were eight father and son combinations. There were at least one African American, a 34 year old man named Prince Estabrook. When Captain John Porker saw the British approaching, he told his nervous Minutemen, Let the troops pass by and don't molest them without they begin first. The Minutemen really weren't there to fight anyway. They mostly wanted to send the British a message. We're here. We have guns. We don't appreciate your visit. Pitt, Karen, and the soldiers marched right up to the Minutemen. No one knew what was about to happen. The first shot. One interesting thing about the moment is that both commanders told their men not to fire. Pitt, Karen gave very clear orders to the British soldiers. I instantly called to the soldiers not to fire but to surround and disarm them. John Porker gave similar orders to the Minutemen. I immediately ordered our troops to disperse and not to fire. So while the British tried to surround the Minutemen, the Minutemen started walking off in different directions. It was a confusing scene. The key point was this. The Minutemen did not drop their guns. This angered the ex excitable Major Pitcairn, who started shouting, You villains, you rebels, lay down your arms. Why don't you lay down your arms? And now, in the middle of all this chaos, someone fired, who, according to Minuteman Sylvanus Wood, there was not a gun fired by any of Captain Parker's company, within my knowledge. I was so situated that I must have known it. But British Lieutenant John Parker told a different story. On our coming near them, they fired, on, they fired one or two shots. So no one takes credit for the shot heard around the world, the first shot of the American Revolution. 
It might have been a Minuteman, or it might have been a British soldier. It might have come from one of the houses in town. What we know is that when the British soldiers heard the shot, they lost control. They started charging, screaming, and firing their guns. Our men, without any orders, rushed, it, rushed in upon them, fired, and put them to flight, said Lieutenant Barker. The men were so wild they could hear no orders. Some of the men and men stood and fired back. Others ran for their lives, blasting away as they retreated through town. Three cheers. The shouting on Lexington Common lasted about ten minutes. It finally ended when Colonel Francis Smith, he's in charge of the mission, remember, rode into town. Smith found a British drummer and ordered him to beat the ceasefire signal. This worked. Eight Minutemen had been killed and nine more wounded, including Prince Estabrook, who was shot in the shoulder. The wounded men crawled to nearby houses for help. Only one British soldier had been shot and slightly hurt. It took Smith about half an hour to get the 700 British boys calmed down and organized. He spent a, t a little time yelling at the men for losing control. He warned them to follow orders next time. Then he let them give them three, cheer three cheers for their victory, and they marched on to Concord. Salmon Update Dorothy Quincy and Aunt Lydia watched the whole thing from the window of the Clark's house. When the shooting started, Lydia leaned out the window to get a closer look. A bullet whistled past her head and crashed into the barn next door. She pulled her head back in. After the British left town, the two women set off in a carriage to meet up at Hancock and Adams. Yes, they remembered to bring Hancock's fine salmon. The salmon was cooked at a house in Woburn. And everyone was sitting down to lunch when a man ran in and started shouting that the British were on their way. So the fish was left behind and Adams and Hancock rode farther from the fighting. Later that day, they ate some cold pork and potatoes. Grand music. Now the action shifted down the road to Concord, where the Concord Minutemen were ready and waiting. How did they know the British were coming? This morning between 1 and 2, we were alarmed by the ringing of the bell explained Reverend William Emerson of Concord. Who brought you the warning, Reverend? The intelligence was brought to us first by Dr. Samuel Prescott, Emerson said. Prescott was the one who had escaped from the British patrol the night before. He raced into Concord and started spreading the news. By 7 in the morning, about 250 Concord Minutemen were gathered in town. They weren't sure what to do, though. They talked it over. They decided to march out to meet the British. A Concord Minuteman named Amos Barrett remembered parading out of town with the group, a few of the men proudly playing their drums and fifes, small flutes. Then, out on the narrow road, they saw the 700 British soldiers coming towards them. They stopped. They realized they hadn't really thought this plan through very well. They turned and ran and marched back into Concord. With the British right behind, both armies had their drummers and fifers going strong. We had grand music, said Amos Barrett. Barrett and the Minutemen marched up into the hills above the town and waited to see what the British were going to do. The Americans had time on their side. The alarm had been spreading from town to town all morning, and more Minutemen were pouring in from the towns around Concord. Soon there were 300 Minutemen in the hills, then 350, then 400. There were also lots of people from town, mostly kids, who were up there to watch. It was getting crowded. The Minutemen had to ask the spectators to go somewhere else. Josiah Haynes was the oldest man to fight that day. He was 79 years. He was a 79-year-old Minuteman had gotten up at dawn, grabbed his musket, and marched eight miles to Concord. Now he was glaring down at the North Bridge, and the British soldiers guarding the bridge had told the captain of his town's militia, If you don't go and drive them British from that bridge, I shall call you a carrot, ca coward. Uh, hold on there, Josiah. Everyone was still hoping this day would end without more bloodshed. Breakfast time. Down in town, British soldiers started looking for weapons. That was the whole idea of this mission. As Gage's secret orders to Colonel Smith explained, You will seize and destroy all the artillery, ammunition, provisions, tents, small arms, and all military stores, whatever. But you will take care that the soldiers do not plunder the inhabitants or hurt private property.
Unfortunately for Gage, the people of Concord had been expecting something like this for days. By now, nearly all of the military supplies were hidden in attics or buried in fields. At the Wood family house, for example, a pile of guns had been hastily shoved into a bedroom. When a British came to search the house, the Wood women welcomed the soldiers. They told the men that they could search anywhere they wished except for one small bedroom where a sick woman was sleeping. The British soldiers considered themselves gentlemen, and they would never disturb a sick woman, so they ordered their men to leave that room alone. Needless to say, no weapons were found in the wood house. Meanwhile, Colonel Smith and some other British officers set up chairs on people's lawns and started ordering breakfast. They, these guys were used to being served. Women in Concord grumbled and gave a few lectures on the rights of Americans and they were willing to make a little money. They sold the soldiers meals of meat, potatoes, and milk. All the while, the soldiers kept up their search for supplies. They found a few barrels of flour and some musket balls. They tossed it all into a pond. A few days later, the people finished everything out, fished everything out. Most of the flour was still good. They found a few cannons and they destroyed them. They smashed up the wooden carriages that were used to haul the cannon around. Then they set up the broken wood they broken wood on fire. That fire changed a lot of lives.